Amen, amen, amen. Worship. Worship. Why are you here? To worship? What does that really mean to you? What does the idea of worship mean for you? Not only here in this hour, but every day of your life. We're going to talk about this idea of worship as we get into a new month, discovering these qualities and characteristics that you and I have in our life as followers of Jesus as we are being transformed, changing, letting God do something in us. What is that going to be? I want to throw out a word that we talk about quite often, but sometimes don't understand or grasp. Perspective. Perspective. What is your perspective? I'm going to ask you the question, what is your perspective of worship today? But let's think about that word perspective. Perspective, basically, it has some Latin root meaning that talks about looking through. An example of that would be, if we say we're going to look through the perspective of a child, that means that we look through their eyes to see their perspective. Now, here's another interesting thing. Imagine, if you would, your pets. What's the perspective of your pet in your home? Now, some of you may be thinking, Oh my gosh, what does my pet see? But that's perspective. That's the pet's perspective. Through the eyes of whatever that is they're looking. So let me ask you this again. What is your perspective of worship? How do you see worship? What are you looking at when you worship? Because that's going to be important for us to understand this idea as we continue to talk about how God is molding you and what God has for you is your perspective. As we look at worship today and ask the question, what is your perspective of worship? Worship is basically the idea to bow down or to pay honor to something. You think about the things that we worship or the things that we bow down. Imagine this. In movies, when there would be a king, everybody would bow down to the king. It's the idea of worshiping who he is. It's a sign of humility before someone. So this idea of perspective and worship. What is your perspective of worship? This reminds me of a story that I came across this past week that I want to share with you that talks about one particular child's perspective, okay? This is the story. A family was riding home from church one Sunday, and the mom and dad were talking about the songs and the sermon and things that went on. And the little boy in the back of the car piped up and asked this question of his mom. What is the highest number you could ever remember counting to? Puzzled, the mom considered, and then finally wanted to ask him what his number was. And so she said, what is your highest number that you can remember counting to? And the little boy, without hesitation, said, 5,372. The mom was a little puzzled at that, and she said, well, why that particular number? Why did you stop at that number? And the little boy said, with confidence, because church was over. Now, I know some of you right now are beginning that process of counting. Don't go down the dark path. You see, the little boy had this perspective of what church was, counting away every second to see what number he could get to. And some of us today, sadly, have a perspective like that of worship. That's why I ask you, why are you here today to worship? As we look at this idea of worship And the incredible things that it can do for us, what is your perspective of worship? How do you see worship for you today? Because you may think, well, I'm not old enough to worship. Everybody can worship. Everybody can worship. No matter your age, you can worship. And it's not just in here that we worship, church. We worship through everything because as we see God, we worship Him. Let me rephrase that. As we see God, we should Worship Him. There's four things that I want to share with you. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms 96. Psalms 96, because that's where we're going to camp out today. But we're going to have four questions that I'm going to ask you about your perspective of worship. Because this is an amazing thing for us to see and to understand as we again talk about how we can be changed in our journey of faith as a follower of Jesus. Throughout this whole year, we've been looking at different qualities and perspectives that we can have. And what an amazing thing is we come off the idea of love. 
God's love for us as we talk about this amazing thing that God has for us and our love for God, let me tell you, it can be seen in how you worship. You want to see somebody worshiping? That's a person who's in love with God. You want to see somebody who worship is always with them? That's somebody who's always loving God. The two go hand in hand, and that's why we're talking about worship after love. Okay, four questions about worship. The first one is, how fresh is your worship? How fresh is your worship? Now, you may, you may be thinking, fresh? Paul, you're talking about vegetables. You're talking about fresh flowers that you go out and pick. How are you talking about worship being fresh? Let's look at this passage because we're going to break it down and look at these questions. Psalms 96. Let's read that together in your Bibles, on your app. Let's read. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise His name, proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant in everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for He comes he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. How fresh is your worship? The psalmist gives us an idea of the answer to this question in verse 1 when he says, Sing to the Lord a new song. How fresh is your worship? What I mean by that is, are you singing a new song? The psalmist says, a new song. Something that is fresh. You see, we live in a culture where a lot of times we get bogged down by so many things. Have you ever been on the computer and it just stops? You ever been wanting to download a video or something and it just bogs down? And sometimes what I do is my patience <laughs> is tested. And so I'm constantly pushing the refresh button. Come on, come on. You ever talk to your computer or your phone or your tablet or whatever it is? As if they have ears and can hear, which they do have a microphone. I don't know if you know that. Some of those do. It's pretty neat. You can have different languages on there too. That's pretty wild. But anyway, sometimes you need to push the refresh button. Sometimes, church, you and I, in our perspective and understanding of who God is, we've got to push the refresh button. Why? Because we've lost the idea of where we're at. We just get bogged down because of all the things that are going on in our life. And so we need to refresh. The psalmist says, sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Why? Because I think sometimes you and I get into this idea where the beautiful, listen to me, church, the beautiful becomes the boring. The beautiful becomes the boring. Have you ever been in that place in your life? Imagine this. Those of us that are up early in the morning sometimes, we get to see the blessing of the sunrise. Or you can see the blessing of the sunset. Have you ever looked at the sky and how orange or purple or whatever it is as the sun is rising up, how beautiful the landscape can be? And then sometimes, as soon as it's over, we get busy with the day and we forget about that. Folks, the psalmist says, sing a new song as if you never forget that sunrise. As if you never forget the beauty of what God has done for you. When you think about worship and who God is, think about all that He's done for you so that you don't forget what that looks like in your life. In your life. I'm not just talking about being in church. I'm not just talking about being good in your attendance. I'm talking about what God is doing for you today. That's when you should say, sing 
Sing, sing a new song. Don't let the beautiful become boring. How fresh is your worship? How fresh is your worship? Do you need to reboot and ask God, God, what are you doing today? Do you need to reboot and refresh and to say, God, just show me who you are today. Let me wake up a little early so I can see the sunrise so that I can be reminded of how great you are. Then, God, my heart will overflow with praise regardless of where I'm at. Don't forget the beauty. Because you see what happens when we forget and we get busy and we keep moving on and we lose our focus. The beauty becomes boring. And then we begin to look for something else. You know what I'm talking about, church? Then we begin to look for something else to become beautiful and to catch our eye. Don't let the beauty of God and who he is become boring. How fresh is your worship? Second thing that I want to share with you is, second question, is how alive is your worship? How alive is your worship? Now, let's look at this. In the psalmist, it gives us an idea of what we are to do. He talks about, in verse 2, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. Proclaim his salvation. Now, an interesting thing about this, this is Old Testament here. This is Old Testament stuff. Where is Jesus? Where's the salvation that you and I know about in Jesus? It doesn't come till the New Testament. This is the Old Testament. So what are they saying about salvation? You've got to understand what they're talking about in this particular time. In the Old Testament, all they could rely upon was the priest to go in and to perform the sacrifice so that they could be cleansed. The blood that was shed could cleanse them and renew them and refresh them in the relationship with the holy, mighty God. That was their idea of salvation. So why is it that you and I today, when we know Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, was put into the tomb but rose again? Again, who is alive today, how is it that we lose sight of that salvation and we don't understand how alive our God is? And yet we say, I've forgotten what has God done for me. God is alive. Jesus is alive and he's alive in your heart. So how can you say, I don't know how to worship? Ask yourself this question, church. How alive is your worship? Some of you today right now need to get a little life in you. Are you here? Are you breathing? Who's alive with me today? I feel like I might start preaching today for some reason. How alive is your worship? Folks, let me tell you, there's days where I don't feel like worship. Have you been there? There's days where I don't feel like worship. Why? Because the world has blinded me. I'm in a fog. Have you ever felt like you've been in a fog and you can't see anything out? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to try to fix things? Am I supposed to turn on the fan to clear out the fog? What am I supposed to do? The scripture says, sing a new song. Proclaim salvation. Not just once. Listen to me. Not just on Sunday. Not just on Wednesday at Crosswalk. Not just in that event that I'm going to. Day by day, always singing a new song, proclaiming the salvation that God has given us. That's going to give you an alive worship, church. How fresh is your worship? How alive is your worship? Is it with you today? Is it with you tomorrow? Is it with you Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Is it with you Saturday? Is it with you where you go at night? Is it with you in the morning when you wake up? Is it alive within you? Because if not, then church, what we got is a dead worship. And, And don't get me even started about talking about dead worship. Is that even possible? It's kind of like saying jumbo shrimp. Jumbo shrimp. Where's the concept in that? Dead worship. Dead worship. It can't happen, church. It's got to be alive. How fresh is your worship? How alive is your worship? You see, we need to proclaim what God has done for us. Let me ask you this question. What is God doing for you today? What is God doing for you today? Somebody told me earlier that they're just grateful to God to have another day. And I think, you know, we say that over and over. We say that sometimes. Thank you, God, for this day. But you know what? That's good because we're acknowledging who God is and that God gave us this day, that God has blessed us with this day, that God is doing good things. What is God doing for you today? What is he doing for you right now? Is he laying on your heart what you need to do to give over to him so that he can be God? Is he filling you with hope and joy when you know that as soon as you walk out this door, you're going to be faced with the things that pull you down? 
Is God doing something in your life today? Is he calling to you if you've never given your life to Jesus, saying, come to me so that I can give you a new life, a life that you don't understand, but a life that you can journey and learn? What is God doing for you today? Because let me tell you, that's what's going to make your worship alive. Well, I don't have anything to worship. I don't have anything to sing about. Paul, I don't have anything in my life. Well, the question I have for you is, where is Jesus? Because if you're living your life and you're saying, well, I don't have anything to worship, I can't worship. Where's Jesus? That's all I got to say. Where's Jesus? Because if you focus upon him, then there will be a live worship. Is it fresh? Is it alive? Third question, how focused is your worship? How focused is your worship? Now, let's look at this. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a little distracted. Sometimes I get a little spread thin. Sometimes I get a little confused. Sometimes I'm in a, in a slump. Sometimes I'm in a rut. Sometimes I don't know where I'm going. The direction is all confusing. And I say, God, what are you doing? I don't know if you're ever like that. How focused is your worship? Let's look back at verse 4. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Now, we should know that. If we know Jesus as our Savior and know what Jesus did for us and believe in what he did and have faith in that, then we should know that God is worthy of our worship and praise. But he says this, He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord, the Lord made the heavens. Now, let's talk about idols, can we? (laughs) Let's talk about idols. Folks, an idol, listen to me, okay? An idol is anything that you praise or worship. An idol is anything that you praise or worship that takes your attention and your focus, and that's all that you're going to. It could be a person. It could be a thing. It could be anything. It could be a job. It could be a relationship. It could be anything. When we have idols in our life that take the place, listen to me, church, that take the place of God, then it becomes the idol in our life that we worship. God's word says, don't do it. Don't worship idols. Don't have idols. Why? Because God is a jealous God. Why? Is God jealous like we think of jealousy? No. He's jealous because he wants all of you so he can feel all of you. He wants all of you so all of him can come into you. That's why God wants all of you, so that he can save you, so that you can have that relationship the way that you're created to, so he can do great things. But yet sometimes when we're not focused in our worship, we forget about what God has done and the idols creep in. Let me ask you this, what's more important to you, your job? Is that what you're pouring your life into is your job? Your relationship. Is your relationship so important that you're going to pour yourself into and compromise? Let's, let's go a little farther and step on a few more toes. What about your identity, your self-esteem? Is it more important that you would compromise everything that God wants to give you to say, I'm going to feel good about myself? Let me tell you, feelings change. Feelings fail. Feelings will fade away. But the truth of God is that he loves you and he's never going to forsake you and that he's always going to be there for you. But sometimes we lose our focus. Sometimes we lose our focus. When we come to worship on anything else, when our focus is on anything else than God, then it becomes an idol. You know, an interesting thing that I saw this past week, and maybe some of you watched um, NBA Finals. It was just kind of an interesting thing. Usually I don't watch a whole lot of professional basketball, but I do when it gets time to the finals and stuff. But I just happened to see when they introduced the teammates and the athletes. Who would have known that fire could come out of basketball goals? I mean, it was an incredible thing. It was a show. I mean, the smoke was going and the fireworks were going. I told them in the early service, Bob, I think we need to get a little fireworks. I mean, we need, we need to get something exciting here. Because let me tell you, those people were praised. When they were introduced and everybody went wild and the fire was shooting out of the basketball goes. Think about, the, think about NFL teams, what they do. The smoke as the players are running out of the tunnel. And you know what they do. They do their little dance and all that kind of stuff. And everybody goes wild. Those players were praised and worshipped. What's your idol, church? Because let me tell you, when you and I lose our focus of the worship of the one true God, then it becomes an idol in our life. And it can be anything. 
Anything. Do you hear me? It could be anything. Everything from a grade point average to a job to a relationship to an identity to fashion, whatever it is, it can become an idol. How focused is your worship on the God who loves you more than life itself because he proved that through Jesus. And he gave his son to die on the cross for your sins so that if you trust in what Jesus did, listen to me, church, if you trust that, then God's saying, I want to give you that life. I want to give you that life every day. So just worship me and praise me. Listen, the idols. God is to be feared above all gods because the gods of the nation are idols. But listen else what he says. He says, splendor and majesty, strength and glory are in his sanctuary. So so in essence, what he's telling us is that, listen, this is the presence of God. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his presence. This describes the presence of God, the person in the room. So in Hebrews chapter 10, this reminds me of a passage. In verse 19 through 22, Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Listen, when Jesus, again, Old Testament, they were saying, praise God for the salvation that comes day and day. But for us that know what Jesus did, listen, when Jesus died on the cross, you got to remember in the temple was the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the presence of God was believed to be and was. Scripture teaches that. And it was separated by this big curtain. And only the priest could go in there to be in the presence of God. But listen, church. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened is that curtain ripped, which means that now the presence of God, the place of God, the person in the room is now within each and every one of us because of the spirit of Jesus that came, the Holy Spirit that came down upon us. So what happens is, listen, church, is now the presence of God is now within you when you trust Jesus. So let me ask you, how focused is your worship to know that the presence of God is in your heart? I feel like I'm yelling. But let me tell you, when you know, when you know, when you know that you have the power of God living within you through the Holy Spirit, let me ask you, how focused is your worship? Students, let me tell you, I know how difficult it is to be so distracted sometimes and so pulled in so many different directions because we as adults do the same. I thought it was bad when I was a teenager and then I became an adult and then I became a parent. I'm like, oh Lord, you didn't prepare me for this. But folks, we've got tough times all around us. We've got things that are going all around us to pull us away from God. But God says, listen, don't lose your focus upon me. Worship me. Worship me. How fresh is your worship? How alive is your worship? How focused is your worship? Fourth thing, we're going to end with this. How true is your worship? How true is your worship? I know in the bulletin there's a lot of scripture. I'm going to let you go back and read that. If we had time, we'd be here for another hour and I could go through all of it. But some of you may get mad at me, so I don't want you mad at me. I just want you to feel the Holy Spirit, okay? So I'm going to say what I need to say and we're going to get out of here and God's going to do his work in your heart. So read these scriptures because it's important in your worship to be able to understand this. Number four, how true is your worship? In verse 10, he says, the Lord reigns. Now, why do they have to keep doing that? Have you ever noticed in Scripture all throughout, especially in the Psalms where it says, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. As if we're going to forget. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. But you know what? We forget. You know what? We forget sometimes because what we think is we can handle things. Have you ever thought that way? I do sometimes. I can handle it. I can fix this problem. I can overcome. Lord, help me. That's what I usually say. Lord, help me. Help me, because what I have to do is I have to remind myself the Lord reigns. Why? Because the Lord created everything. He created who I am. He created the opportunities for me. He created this world. The Lord reigns. He's in control of all things. You know, I don't know what God is doing sometimes. I don't know what's going to happen, but I have to trust in the fact that God is in control of things, that the Lord reigns. And sometimes in my worship church, sometimes in my worship, what I have to do is I have to say, listen, I just have to say the Lord reigns because I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to say because I know that God is true. Do you hear me, church? Do you know that God is true? 
then why is not is your worship true? If you know that God is true and he's going to do what he says, then why not we worship that way? If you know that God is in control of all things, then why do we not humble ourselves before him and worship him like he is true? Is your worship fresh? Is it alive? Is it focused? And is it true? Romans 8, 18 says this. This is good. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You see, God's got an amazing thing for you because he is in control. The Lord reigns. I love how the psalmist says in verse 10, the world is firmly established and it can't be moved. What that means is God is on his throne. God is sovereign. God's going to be there. Yes, our circumstances change. Yes, opportunities change. Yes, our choices change. But God is not going to change. And so what we have to do is to worship him. In closing, let me share this verse. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24 says this. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Verse 24 says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. You see, what John is reminding us is that the Father, God, reigns in all things. And that is true. And he's given us the spirit to be able to have in our hearts. And if we worship in that spirit of the living God, then we will be true in our worship of him. And that's what he seeks. Did you catch that at the end of verse 23? For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. What is your perspective of worship? I know some of you here today have had one of those kind of weeks. Where all you need to do is be refreshed. You just need to come today and to see God for who he is. And I don't know what's on your plate. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you have to face in this week to come or what you've had in this week behind. But let me tell you this. When I'm in those situations, when I'm in those situations, I have to ask myself the questions. Paul, how fresh is your worship? Are you just going through the same old tradition of things? Are you singing a new song because God is alive? Is your worship alive, Paul? Paul, is your worship alive today? Do you know what God is doing in your life today at this moment? Paul, don't be distracted. Remember what God has done for you. Don't lose focus of who God is. No matter what people are saying, no matter what people are doing, no matter what you find yourself in, don't lose focus. Because then you'll know that God is true and your worship of Him is true. Worship is bowing down and humbling ourselves before God because He is God. Perspective is how we look at things. So what is your perspective of worship? of the one true living God. Let's pray.